Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this Women in Science Post-Aid Armor Seminar. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement statement. The Field Museum resides on the ancestral homes of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and we acknowledge our, res and res uh, our respect and gratitude to the many Native people who live here today, as well as their ancestors. Um, so today our speaker is Dr. Sarah Lipschutz from Duke University, and I just want to say I was not supposed to be announcing her, but uh, Sarah, uh, sorry, Sophie, who was supposed to announce her, is unfortunately sick, so at the very end I'm going to include a personal message from her. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Duke University after spending a year as an assistant professor at Loyola University in Chicago. Sarah's work focuses on the genomic and hormonal mechanisms of behavioral evolution across weird and wonderfully diverse species of birds. She combines fieldwork with molecular and computational approaches in genetics, genomics, neuroscience, and endocrinology to understand the mechanisms of key behaviors like ter territorial aggression and parental care. Sarah is particularly interested in systems that challenge the binary expectations of what females and males should do, like the Jacana with fighting females and carrying males. I, uh, so this is Sophie's part. <laughs> Sophie had the pleasure of meeting Sarah in Panama back in 2012, when they were both starting out their careers as field biologists. And Sophie is so proud to see all Sarah has accomplished since then. Without further ado, I'll let Sarah tell us more about the evolution of female competition in birds. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> Ray and Sophie, and thanks uh, to all the folks who are here today. Yeah, so it's kind of a lengthy title, but Fighting for Fitness, uh, Integrating Behavioral, Hormonal, and Neurogenomic expect, uh, Perspectives on the Evolution of Female Competition. And I think that's particularly fitting for a women in science uh, uh, lecture because we're going to kind of take a female perspective of evolution. Um, so I'll start with this video. So I'm a behavioral ecologist, and I like to spend time observing animals and what they do. And so here we have this amazing bird doing this brooding behavior with chicks, right? Holding them close, providing body warmth and safety. And I just want to pull the audience here. When we see these kind of parental behaviors, and now maybe you know something about this particular species, but in general, when we see these kind of behavioral um, behaviors, do we think that they are coming from, raise your hand if you think female animal, Right, it's kind of a setup here versus male animal. So, so actually, this individual here is a male jacana, and in this species, um, uh, nearly every species in this family, jacanidae, has uh, the females have lost parental care, and the males do the majority of parental care, and that means incubating and foraging the chicks and doing just uh, really cool brooding behavior. And this is an individual, um, and their chicks from the San Diego Zoo. So it's really cool they have a, a breeding population in captivity there. So um, in order for an animal to uh, pass on its genes to the next generation, uh, for lots of species, it involves reproductive competition. And so we kind of can think about, uh, we think of sexual selection, parental care, and competition as kind of these partners in the roles that animals play um, in how mating happens. And, and so for lots of species, this involves things like uh, territorial disputes, potentially fighting with weaponry or signals like song or color. Um, and, you know, most of what we know about the evolution of reproductive competition comes from research on male animals. Really, historically, males have been the models for this work, um, whether it's looking at bird song or animal weaponry in, in males that are fighting, like antlers. Um, but actually, female competition is widespread in the animal kingdom, uh, especially the more we look for it, the more we find that uh, competitive traits in female animals are adaptive. So individuals that have larger weapons or more aggressive behavior, um, that confers a kind of fitness advantage uh, for survival and reproduction. So, okay, we know that female competition is widespread, but in comparison to the male study systems, we know far less about the molecular mechanisms that regulate uh, these female competitive traits. And so that's the work that I have been interested in doing since my dissertation. Uh, first, I started thinking about the kind of um, 
differences among species that might affect population <laughs> outcomes for hybridization and speciation. And then in my postdoc, really getting more into the molecular mechanisms like hormones and gene expression in the brain and how that might regulate female competition. So it's kind of the causes and the consequences of female competition. And so um, work in our lab is always changing, um, but this is kind of a summary of some of what we do. Um, and so today I'm gonna tell two stories, uh, one about sex variation and diversity uh, in Jacanas, and another about um, kind of expanding across uh, many species of songbirds at how female competition um, evolves and shapes phenotypic traits. Um, and so some of the mechanisms that we use here are genomics and we work in the brain um, and looking at hormones. And more recently, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we're starting to work on anthropogenic change. So we just got a grant from the NSF to study light and noise pollution in songbirds. Um, and my PhD student, Maddie Chudzik is actually doing a, her research project based in Chicago on bird migration and um, how the city poses challenges for birds. Um, okay, so let's dive into the two stories for today's talk. The first one is kind of getting at this question of why female and male animals might behave differently. And we can also say, you know, how are they the same? Um, I think oftentimes our questions try to like ask about the differences. And this is why this is framed in terms of sex variation and diversity. So um, what, basically what is the variation out there in terms of phenotypes like competition and parental care. And then for this particular species, what might be the molecular, me molecular mechanisms that explain those differences or similarities? Um, and then for the second question, um, we're expanding across lots of species now, and we're asking whether uh, these shared competitive pressures, um, in this case, the cavity nesting strategy, so having to nest in a hole in a tree, um, can shape parallel evolution across species in terms of behavior hormones, and gene expression in the brain. So uh, I've already introduced you a bit to this system. Uh, I showed you a waddle jacana uh, in the first video. This is the northern jacana, a close relative. Um, and in these species, they have a mating system known as social polyandry. So females here uh, will compete uh, for territories that encompass multiple males. And so sexual selection is stronger on females. They have more mating opportunities. Um, Females can simultaneously copulate with multiple males in a breeding season. Uh, these clutches often have mixed paternity. So males are often caring for offspring that are not their own. And males do all the parental care. So uh, they have a brood patch, whereas females don't. Um, they incubate the eggs. They, they brood, brood chicks and forage with chicks. Um, and there's also a pretty big size dimorphism. So females on average are much larger than males, especially when they're territorial. Although there are a lot of floater individuals in the population. Today, I'll focus on the territorial ones. Um, and they have these really cool weapons called wing spurs. So they're this, these cratinous um, pointy growths and um, there's a bone underneath and they use them for signaling and fighting. Um, and then they have also these uh, fleshy facial ornaments. So we've got these competitive traits that both sexes have, although they're more strongly developed in females. But we were wondering, okay, well, this is a really unique system. Uh, are the sort of underlying mecha molecular mechanisms that are uh, co-varying with these phenotypic traits, uh, how do they work in females, right? Is it the same as in males or do they use kind of diverse unique pathways? So one of our go-to hormones is testosterone. So when we think about the hormone testosterone, we think aggression, bigger body mass, um, kind of like the Roy Rage Hulk thing, like a hormone that we all kind of know as humans, right? Um, so, so, you know, potentially if females are more competitive, could it be because they have higher testosterone in circulation? Now, in the male jacanas, they actually, um, during the breeding season, will cycle between two uh, behavioral states. So one of them is parenting, right? Incubation and being with the chicks. But the other is this courtship or copulation phase. And so it's interesting to think about in this system, the females that are territorial during the breeding season, they have a pretty constant state of fertility. They're just constantly laying eggs and, and fighting over their territories. But the males are cycling in between these two stages of parenting and courting. And I was curious to know whether testosterone might co-vary with mating traits and that, how that might be shaped by this, you know, maybe they're more consistent in females, but because males are switching between this, these stages, testosterone might also kind of shift. Um, we know from studies of other birds and other species that testosterone, when it's high, can interfere with parental care. 
And then we, you know, testosterone is just one hormone. So we wanted to also take this more global approach of getting at lots of different kinds of molecular pathways. And so we looked at uh, patterns of gene expression in, in two different brain regions associated with social behaviors like aggression and parental care. So um, in order to let this work, uh, we went down to Panama. This was in 2018. I got to work with a really great undergrad, Evan Buck and master student, Clara Howell. And this is how we went about uh, measuring territorial aggression in these birds. So we, we go, um, we look for where the females are being territorial, getting in fights, defending territories. And then we place this conspecific taxidermy decoy onto the territory. And let's see if this video can work. There we go. So it's um, me behind this camouflage blind, just like pulling the strings of this fake bird. Um, and she's in an aggressive posture. And so uh, this was how we measured uh, territorial aggression, how close the female um, whose territory it was, was how close she was to this perceived intruder, um, how much she attacked it, how much she vocalized at it. Um, and then we collected this suite of morphological traits like body size, the wing spur length, and the facial shield length. Um, and then we caught these birds, we took uh, a blood sample, we did an enzyme amino assay to measure testosterone and circulation from the plasma. Um, and then we also collected whole brains and flash froze them, and I'll talk about that a little later. So here's the suite of traits uh, that we predicted to be involved in mating competition. And to answer this first question, we looked at the levels of testosterone and circulation. We've got our three groups, females, parenting males, and courting males. And you can see that that females do not have higher testosterone in circulation than males, at least during this breeding stage. Um, so females are in this constant state of territoriality during the breeding season, but you can see males are in these two different stages. And actually it's testosterone in males that's shifting between those two stages. So when males are parenting, they have low testosterone. It's similar to the levels that females have. And then when males are courting, small sample size here, but on average, uh, the testosterone is higher in those courting males. And so um, it's interesting to think here that when you think about a sex difference, that it's kind of time dependent, it's gonna be stage dependent here, and that you need to consider the, the breeding stage of the males to when it's shared versus different. Um, we did a meta-analysis across uh, as many socially polyandrous bird species that we have testosterone data for, and we found a really similar pattern. So that females and males um, have indistinguishable testosterone levels during this parenting stage, but during the courtship stage is when males have higher testosterone in circulation. So you might be thinking, okay, well, testosterone like doesn't play a role in competition in these birds, right? We don't find this pattern that females have higher levels. Um, but when we looked at our competitive traits, we actually did find this positive and significant correlation here. So in that wing spur weapon, and this is just for females, we didn't find this pattern in males, uh, females that have longer wing spurs have more testosterone circulation. That was interesting to us because we think about this weapon as something that's growing over time. And so maybe there's this kind of testosterone is something that is associated with being older or just, you know, kind of living long enough to have this competitive status. Um, so that was really interesting to us, uh, but we didn't find any correlations between testosterone and aggressive behavior. Um, and so that encouraged us to look at other potential mechanisms that might explain variation in competitive behavior in these species. And so we went to the brain. So this was a really fun project because um, Jacanas are very non-model. Uh, and so, you know, we had to use the chick brain atlas and then figure out um, from our nissel stain cryosectioned uh, slices here, uh, where the regions were that we wanted to focus on. And we um, looked at two parts of the social behavior or social decision-making network. These are areas of the brain that are associated with uh, social behaviors like parental care and aggression. And so we narrowed in on the nucleus canine here, which is like the bird version of the amygdala in mammals, um, as well as the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. And this is a, a, a these are two regions that are associated with aggression and parental care, um, although they do lots of other social behaviors too. And for this, um, Austin, uh, an undergrad at Indiana University, did all of the cryosectioning and microdissection. Um, we also had to sequence a genome for this project to work, right? Again, like thinking about the resources and how non-model jacanas are. Um, so we needed a, a reference 
genome to map our RNA seq readings to. So Quinn um, was a master's student at the time at Loyola, and she did the bioinformatics. And then Tessa is here. She's um, my master's student um, finishing up. And so a lot of this work is now her project on um, finishing the statistics and kind of digging more deeply into the bioinformatics. So we've got, these are the same individuals that we have the testosterone from. So now we're looking at patterns of gene expression in the brain for these three different groups. So um, the first pattern that we looked at was just, well, how is this um, RNA-seq data distributed? Uh, and so we did a principal components analysis and you can see these two axes of variation here. And here on PC1, what we're seeing is pretty much dividing out the two brain regions. Um, and so the biggest, like sort of explanatory variable in this data set is these two distinct brain regions, the nucleus canea and the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. That was surprising to me because like they're not that far away from each other in the brain, but we're kind of seeing this like tissue specific signature that's coming out as the most salient. Um, and then the next axis of variation explaining about 7% is uh, splitting out the sexes between females and males. And then we weren't able to distinguish between those two um, male breeding stages. They're all clustered together. So the next thing we did was look at differentially expressed genes. Um, and so here, uh, these, are the, these are genes that were higher in females and these are genes that were higher in males. So we have this interesting sex bias pattern of expression. If, if you have seen this result before, come talk to us because we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we wouldn't you know, expect necessarily the direction of expression to be higher in one sex versus another for these genes. Um, so we see that there are more differently expressed genes in this brain region, the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, than in the nucleus canine. Um, And these are uh, genes that were differentially expressed between males in those two breeding stages. And we have much fewer of them. Um, and then there is just one gene here that was different between males in the nucleus canine. Um, so that was like, hundreds of genes, we decided to pull out some candidates that have known um, relationships to behavior in other species to kind of ask this question about, um, well, like how well conserved are these mechanisms promoting aggression in parental care? Like basically do Dukanas work like other systems in terms of like the evolution of these molecular mechanisms or do they use sort of unique pathways? Um, and we found some interesting patterns. So here looking at androgen receptors, so this is a gene that encodes a protein that binds testosterone and then can affect transcription of lots of other genes. And we see here that parenting males uh, have much lower androgen receptor. And we can interpret that as having decreased sensitivity to testosterone. So this is kind of mirroring our pattern of looking at testosterone in circulation for these birds. Males uh, that were parenting had lower testosterone and they also have lower expression of androgen receptor. So they're really like shutting down their testosterone and their sensitivity to testosterone during the stage, which might make them better parents, right? More, less likely to fight and more likely to care. Um, and we see that females on average had higher uh, androgen receptor expression than the other two groups. And that's interesting, right? Because we know females have low levels of testosterone in circulation, but one way that you might increase your sensitivity is through the expression of this androgen receptor. And so females might be able to regulate aggression by being more sensitive to the testosterone at low levels that they have. Um, so thinking about parenting, um, we also found this interesting pattern of the prolactin receptor. So prolactin is a hormone associated with parenting in mammals, but also in birds. Um, it's associated with incubation. And we see that the prolactin receptor, so the sensitivity to the prolactin hormone is higher in parenting males. Um, and it's, it's higher in both groups and it's low in females. And so we've got these kind of just two candidates that are explaining um, really what's going on with the parenting male. So initially, like we planned this project as like, let's look at female competition, but it turns out there's some really interesting things going on with male parenting as well. Um, so we're doing a lot more analyses on this work. Um, you can definitely talk more with Tessa about some of the work that she's doing. She's now taking gene networks and associating um, them with the traits that we measured, including aggression. So we have a lot more um, to share in the future. Um, but basically, you know, it didn't come down to this simple pattern of Jacanas are more, females are more competitive because they have higher testosterone in circulation. Um, but their sensitivity to testosterone is higher. And so that is an interesting um, kind of thought about the testosterone signaling system. It's not just about the 
um, the molecule that's the signal. It's about the system that receives it. Um, so kind of considering both parts of that system is maybe um, opening a window to how female competition might be regulated in katanas. Um, and we did find that interesting pattern in the correlation between a weapon and testosterone in circulation. Um, and then patterns of differential gene expression, when we pull out some candidates, they kind of align with conserved pathways that explain uh, parental care and other systems, but we have some more work to do with our gene expression data to kind of answer these global questions about how all of these genes are working um, together to regulate our competitive traits that we're interested in. Okay, so that's the first story on Jacanas. The next story is about songbirds. And so this, so this, the Jacana project was, um, came out of this D-Day grant when they used to exist. It's kind of like when you're finishing your dissertation, it's like this cherry on top. What's the dream research that you could do? And I like wanted to become more of a, like a integrative physiologist, like being able to go from connecting behaviors in birds to like the molecular mechanisms that might regulate them. Um, but you know, Jacanas are a pretty weird system. And I wondered, well, what if there's, female competition that's important in other systems that's just underappreciated, right? So we look at Jacanas as a kind of extreme example, but I was wanting to, to look more broadly and ask like, where is female competition selected for? And, and where, does it, where is it important in other systems that aren't those exceptions? Um, and that brought me to work with Kim Roswell for my postdoc. So I have an NSF fellowship to look at the evolution of this cavity nesting behavior. Now at the time, um, Kim was working with tree swallows. And if anyone has been attacked by a tree swallow during the breeding season, females are very aggressive. So we knew that that was special about tree swallows. But I wondered, well, is the tree swallow special or is it really the cavity nesting strategy that can help us understand the evolution of female aggression? And then what are the associated molecular mechanisms um, that might be uh, helping shape this aggressive behavior? So the cavity nesting strategy, um, this is when birds nest in a cavity. This can be a hole in a tree um, or in a nest box, which makes them really tractable to study. And for these um, species, this is their only opportunity to breed. They can't go and make their own hole like a woodpecker. They're secondary obligate cavity nesters. Um, and so we thought this is a particularly restricted ecological resource that they rely on to breed. Um, and actually the cavity nesting strategy has independently evolved over 30 times in birds. So that's a really nice comparative framework to ask about the independent evolution of the nesting strategy and the associated behaviors and molecular mechanisms that might shape um, these traits. So we are kind of asking a similar framework here, like if you're a cavity nester, are you more aggressive in the first place, right? So is, is what we found in tree swallows broadly applicable to all cavity nesting species? Um, and then how do they get aggressive if they are more aggressive? Is it with higher testosterone in circulation? or looking at these kind of pro-aggression genes in the brain. Um, now, we did this study in the Midwest. I was based in Indiana. We, we were trying to basically get all of the obligate cavity nesters that we could um, who have a close relative in the same family nearby. So um, for example, the uh, house wren is the obligate cavity nester. The Carolina has a more flexible nesting strategy. It can nest in a cavity or it can build a nest in a shoe or your shed. Um, and then so similarly for bluebird, um, Eurasian tree sparrow, we got to go to central Illinois where there's a bunch of Eurasian tree sparrows. Um, for thonitary warblers, we got to go to southern uh, Illinois to these amazing cypress swamps. And then tree swallows we studied in Kentucky. Um, and so each of these is a species pair. So there's five avian families total. And these were the birds that um, were most tractable for us to work with because of their geographic location, but also because of this like paired um, paired uh, availability. So the obligate cavity nester and the species that has a more flexible nesting strategy, they could be an open cup nester or they could be a facultative cavity nester. But all of the birds here on the left, they're like our focal species. Those are the obligate cavity nesting species. Um, and this was cool because it allowed us to start using some phylogenetic approaches to ask about the evolution of behaviors and physiological traits. So how did we collect this data? Um, with like a small army of undergraduates at uh, Indiana University. Um, so Jace was an RU student. Um, Abby was, um, did a postdoc with us and she just finished her PhD. Um, Amanda is now in med school and um, 
Sam did a lot of really cool uh, hormone and um, behavioral work on this project. So to collect this data, we focused on aggression and it was kind of similar to the Jucanas, except um, these decoys didn't move, uh, but they were, were still uh, taxidermy birds. Um, it would be embarrassing if the preppers in the room knew how we prepared these decoys because it was like a 3D printed body and then a lot of hot glue, um, but it worked. And so you can see here a female territorial tree swallow uh, just totally attacking um, this, this decoy here. Um, and then, and, and these were birds that, um, you know, they were from the same population uh, or the same year, uh, but they, they were really uh, recognized as like a competitor. Um, we took uh, blood samples and plasma from that blood, and then also in the field collected whole brains, flash froze them. And here, instead of doing that cryo section and the micro dissection, we did um, like an easier macro dissection and just took out a kind of big chunk of the brain that we're calling the ventral medial pelencephalon. And this contains nucleus canae as well as lateral septum and the nucleus of the stria terminalis. These are all parts of the social behavior network. Um, and we got a lot of samples. So over 300 um, behavioral assays in birds, um, and then almost 200 testosterone samples and over 100 uh, brain samples. So really a massive uh, effort from this team. Okay, so the first question, we're wondering about aggression. So if you're a cavity nesting species, do you have higher aggression? And so you'll see a couple of graphs like this. Um, here on the y-axis is, is the attack rate. So for a five minute aggression assay, what proportion of time did you spend physically attacking that decoy? And it could be like 100% of the time or none of the time. Um, so like this bird is really attacking. Um, and then we have our species pairs down here for each of the five families. Now the open nesters are represented by just the single nest. The facultative have this, um, the paired of like they could do either. And then the obligate cavity nesters are just this nest box alone. Okay, so what did we find? Well, this is as predicted. Um, and this is something that really was intuitive. Like when we're out in the field um, doing these aggression assays of these birds, like we can tell who's aggressive. And you're just like, yeah, they're really like beating the crap out of that decoy. Um, and so here's what we see that uh, pre swallow females were way more aggressive than males, but mostly it was uh, for other species, the males were more aggressive than the females. But if you consider the nesting strategy, the obligate cavity nesters on the whole were more aggressive than their close relatives. So Tree swallows were way more aggressive than barn swallow, prothonotary warbler way more aggressive than yellow warbler. Now, interestingly, for those species pairs that had a facultative cavity nester, we didn't see that difference, right? So no difference in aggression between Eurasian tree sparrows and house sparrows. They basically just sat there during the trial. That was surprising to us because we think about house sparrows as being so aggressive, but really the house sparrows are aggressive for its heterospecifics, and we were measuring conspecific aggression. So you can imagine a whole other scenario about like heterospecific aggression, but we're focusing on same species. Um, Eastern bluebirds were way more aggressive than robins. And then we didn't find uh, significant differences between the two renders. They're both similarly aggressive. Okay, so that was really cool that we found this supported hypothesis. Um, we also ran this with a PGLM, so we like accounted for evolutionary relationships here. Um, but what was even more interesting to us was that there was a significant interaction between the cavity nesting strategy and sex. So in particular, female obligate cavity nesters were more aggressive than females with those other nest strategies. So here you can see that female obligate cavity nesters have higher attack rate than females of the facultative or the open group. And that was exciting to us because it suggested that it's not only the tree swallow that's special, that female aggression really is higher in the species that have the obligate cavity nesting strategy. Okay, so what molecular mechanisms might explain this? It wasn't testosterone, at least at this average species level. So what you're seeing here is on the whole, males have higher testosterone in circulation than females, and that's a pretty known pattern, um, something that we saw with the jacanas, at least during the males in the courting stage. Um, and this is all happening before egg laying. So all of these birds are in this kind of territorial establishment or um, courtship stage. And we didn't find any relationship with that strategy here. Um, but this wasn't our primary question, but we did have a couple samples that we were able to correlate aggression with testosterone. And we did find for the few samples that we had that in female tree swallows, 
this uh, territorial aggression is positively correlated with testosterone. And I have to say that like both for the competitive trait in the jacanas and the aggression in these birds, like I was really surprised because a lot of people that work on testosterone sort of before you work on testosterone, you're like, oh yeah, testosterone is going to explain everything. And then you do your work and you're like, no, the averages like didn't pan out, um, you know, from these evolutionary perspectives. But then at the individual level, we're finding these patterns. And so there could be something different about kind of the microevolutionary processes versus this like macroevolutionary pattern um, that we're seeing, you know, comparing across species versus among individuals and like why those relationships might change. So that was, that was pretty interesting to us um, to kind of compare those two perspectives. Okay, so then we looked at patterns of gene expression in the brain. Um, this was also a fun bioinformatic challenge because we've got 10 different species here. They're all at different stages of evolutionary relatedness. Um, luckily, we have the zebra finch genome, and the zebra finch is like similarly diverged from most of these species. And so um, that was a really good model to use um, for finding orthologs. So we asked, okay, using the zebra finch genome, what are all the genes that we can find in common um, from the transcriptomes of these birds? And we came up with over 10,000 orthologs that we can then use to compare levels of expression across all these species. Um, and I was really grateful for help from um, folks at the Indiana University Bioinformatics and um, also my collaborator, Mark Hibbins at University of Toronto on this project. So looking at this PCA of gene expression, we've kind of got these like blobs of species. I mean, we can even go one step broader. We've got blobs of families. So we've got our wrens clustering here, our thrushes, our swallows, our sparrows, and our warblers. Um, and so it's cool to think about like, these are what species brains look like if you just kind of plot them on two principal component, components axes. Um, and then you can see sex is kind of within those um, on this diagonal. So uh, females in circles and males in triangles. So this is kind of a null hypothesis of what we'd expect to see based on just shared evolutionary relationships. But we're interested in going one step beyond that and asking about the cavity nesting strategy. And so um, we are also going to now use phylogenetic linear um, mixed models to ask about accounting for these evolutionary relationships, um, which of these genes are associated with the cavity nesting strategy, and are they the same across all these different species? Um, oh, yes, this is just that plot that's basically showing um, that, however, for each of these species pairs, um, the divergence time uh, was associated with a degree of differentially, differentially expressed genes. So the thrushes um, were the most diverged and they had the largest number of differentially expressed genes. So again, kind of these evolutionary um, predictions for how different your gene expression should be just based on how long you've diverged in the millions of years. Okay, so how do you compare differences across all of these different species? Well, there's this cool program out there called rank rank hypergeometric approach. And basically it's asking about differences and differences and what is shared between those differences. So I'll walk you through this kind of hypothetical. So let's say we've got our bluebirds and our robins here. The bluebirds are the opposite cavity nester. So this is our thrush species pair. And then we've got our tree swallows and our barn swallows and the tree swallows are the obligate species. So we're asking what genes are differentially expressed between these two and what genes are differentially expressed th between these two and then which of those differences are shared between those two families. So we're really looking at these quadrants here. These are genes that have higher expression in the obligate cavity nester of both of those species pairs. These are the genes that have lower expression um, in the non or in the obligate, so lower in the obligate between these species pairs. So if we find genes along these two axes in this kind of like diagonal, that's telling us that there's parallel patterns of gene expression, that there's kind of concordance in the differences of species pairs. Um, alternatively, if pathways to aggression are unique, we might see more of a scatter where we've got genes in all of these quadrants. And the genes that are upregulated in uh, the bluebirds are not necessarily the same ones that are upregulated in the, in the tree swallows. So these are our two hypotheses. If we've got concordant patterns of gene expression or more like unique for every family. Basically every obligate cavity nesting bird that evolves that strategy is associated with unique mechanisms or parallel mechanisms. And overall, we find a lot of concordance. So when we do these comparisons for each of our families compared to each other, we get a lot of these um, 
hotspots on the heat map along the diagonal. So for each family comparison, we find a lot of genes that are differentially expressed in the same direction for each family in the direction of the obligate cavity nester. So highly concordant expression differences between species pairs across family comparison. So you might look at this and say, oh yeah, like total concordance here, we solved it, there's parallel evolution. But when we look at the identity of what these genes are, every comparison has a different group of genes. So we can plot the number of shared genes for each of those comparisons. And when it's just two families, especially for females, there's over 900 genes that are shared in those comparisons. But when you add more comparisons and more families, you get fewer and fewer shared genes. And so when we ask a question like, for all 10 comparisons, um, what were the shared genes? We only had 11 out of over 10,000 that were shared among all of those comparisons in their expression pattern. So 0.1%. And so if this is a, a question of concordance, um, we find concordance in the expression patterns and direction, but when we look at the identity of those genes, we find very little concordance. So really unique differences are explaining um, the patterns between each family. Um, we can take another approach and you know, our RHO is really just like differences. Um, and because we have a, a, a phylogenetic setup, you're kind of, it's sort of like including phylogeny, but we can more explicitly run phylogenetic general linear, linear mixed models to account for the tree in our patterns of gene expression. And so for each one of those over 10,000 worth logs, um, we asked which of them are associated with the obligate cavity nesting strategy. And here we actually did find a pattern where there were over 100 differentially expressed genes that are convergently evolving in association with the obligate cavity nesting strategy. When we look at what those genes do, a lot of them are connected to metabolism and ATP. And you might think, okay, that seems pretty cool. Like if you're going to get in a fight and like, you know, attack, um, that that might be, you know, you might need to mobilize energy there. Um, so that kind of makes sense. But again, it's very few genes that are explaining that. Um, we did a network approach. This is a very overwhelming slide, but um, basically we took all of our genes and we um, put them into different uh, modules or networks of genes. And then we asked about the, the eigengenes of those modules. So kind of like a principal component and correlated that with nesting strategy. And we did find one module, um, the TAN4 module, the name doesn't mean anything. And here these um, non-obligate species had higher expression of this gene network and the obligates had lower expression. And then we looked in these genes in this network and we found there were 44 genes in this network, but none of them like jumped out to us as genes that are important for the regulation of aggression. Um, some of them like the pot one is involved in telomerase, um, like uh, the lengthening of telomeres. Um, here's a heat shock protein that you know helps animals respond to challenges. But you know, the, looking at this network as a whole and the genes that were in it, it really wasn't like, a, oh, here's all of our aggression genes. So again, we're not really finding a story of, um, you know, the, finding the answer of the genes that explain aggression. Um, this is even busier, but it's just a heat map showing these same genes. And we can see that they do have parallel patterns of expression across the gray and the black. Each of those, it's like species pair, that's the obligate and the non-obligate. So yeah, like there's this this network is has this parallel pattern of expression, but the genes in that network aren't really helping us answer our, our behavioral question. Um, we so that was a data set that included both sexes. We've also separated that out and looked at females separately and males separately. And with this network approach, we did find a couple modules or gene networks that were associated with aggression. Um, and there were some, in these networks, there were some genes that popped out more in the regulation of aggression. So a dopamine receptor and a glutamate receptor. And that's interesting too, right? Like why might we find these patterns in the female specific data sets, but not the data set that includes both sexes? And it's possible that the sexes really are using different mechanisms to regulate aggression here. And so if we combine them together, we kind of lose out on what those differences are, but we're, we're finding more of a signature when we separate out the females alone. Um, okay, so to summarize this part, uh, we did find, like, that was a really exciting result, that cavity nesting strategy is associated with higher aggression, and specifically in the female obligate cavity nesting species. 
when you compare average levels across species, it wasn't associated with nesting strategy, but we did find that positive correlation at the individual level in female tree swallows between aggression and testosterone. And then when we look at gene expression, we find some shared patterns of gene expression um, associated with the nesting strategy or with aggression, but really overwhelmingly it's distinct across families. And to me, that suggests that evolution is deploying unique pathways to promote aggression in these species. Um, okay, so how do we kind of bring this all together? Well, in both cases, I was really focused on female perspectives of evolution and thinking about integrating behaviors with underlying molecular mechanisms. Um, but the more that I've worked on female perspectives, I've realized that I'm still kind of asking, like, how are females different from males? Instead of phrasing it more in, like, what is the existing variation in diversity here? And, and then to what extent does that um, fall into our you know, categories of sex. Um, but I've been working with other scientists to think about our, these frameworks of how we define sex and even how we quantify sex um, and all the different ways that bidding into groups might actually prevent us from understanding these patterns. And so I think things like PCAs or correlations are really useful instead of just like differentially expressed genes into groups. And like, yeah, we're going to use all the methods that we have. Um, but it's interesting to think about how our like expectations or biases of what differences we're, you know, even asking a question about sex differences, the, the, you're building in this binning into the question, and then your statistics are going to follow that binning. And so how might we kind of expand the, both the conceptual frameworks and the statistical approaches that we use to understand sex variation? Um, so we have some recent pieces out, um, and one of them kind of thinking about testosterone, right? There's this perception that testosterone is a male hormone. Um, and it's true that on average, males have higher levels of testosterone than females, um, not for all species, but for a lot of species. Um, but it's important to recognize that females have functional levels of testosterone. They might be lower, but they're still doing stuff, right? In fact, in, in my study, the correlations were all in the female animals and not the male animals. So females have the same molecular machinery, including the receptors that bind testosterone, the enzymes that convert testosterone, so they can similarly produce and respond to testosterone. So we should stop referring to testosterone as a male hormone or even a sex hormone. We can just call it a steroid hormone. Um, thinking about this idea of the male brain and the female brain, well, when you're an evolutionary biologist, what we're really seeing is species brains. So like we see this level of difference by family and then difference by species and then ultimately difference by sex. Um, but I think, you know, we get stuck in like these binary expectations of what we should see and statistical approaches like principal components analysis, right? These multivariate approaches allow us to see like a broader diversity than immediately binning those groups. Um, and then, so we have this uh, recent perspective piece published in the journal Integrated and Comparative Biology. Some of you might have been at the UChicago um, DEIA workshop last week where we kind of unpacked our definitions of sex. Um, but in this piece, we talk about how sex is many things. Scientists have many definitions of sex, um, and we're not always recognizing like which versions we're using and how they're influencing the way we do our science. Um, so I encourage you to check out this paper if you're interested in this, these kinds of questions. Um, and then like, okay, why does it matter, right? So uh, <laughs> we're all biologists in this room. We care a lot about scientific research. And so acknowledging the existing frameworks that we use for how we define um, and apply sex variation can shape the questions that we think to ask. Um, if we stick with those binary, we might, we might miss how we understand other organisms. A really awesome example I like to use in birds is female song. So for a really long time, we thought, well, only the male birds sing. And so if a bird is singing, it must be male. And so we're really underappreciating the prevalence of female song. Um, and the more we're studying it now, we're finding it's actually really common and has lots of different cool functions. So that's kind of a hot topic for research right now. Um, some of us might also be teachers. Um, so I teach genetics. Um, and, you know, when we have this binary view of sex, we um, are kind of oversimplifying the way that these processes are functioning. Um, so, for example, when we do a Punnett square of a sex link trait, students understand the way more when we say it's an X link or a Y link trait. Like, that's just easier for getting at the real mechanisms of how it works. Um, and then for the students in our classroom that are uh, gender non-conforming, non-binary, trans, 
um, they feel more included when we're actually talking about the traits themselves and not our binary expectations of these categories. Um, and then at, a, at an even broader level, thinking about uh, the politics of our country right now and the legislation and this idea of how biological sex is used to enact policies that are discriminatory and harmful for our minoritized community. Um, and so ways that you know, scientists don't always agree on how we define sex, but then by, the politicians are using what they're perceiving as this like totally set in stone definition of biological sex. Um, so I just encourage you to ask about how your own research might intersect with some of these ideas. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks to all my collaborators and funding sources and um, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, great talk. I loved it. And I have three questions. <laughs> first question is where can I find that paper? <laughs> oh, yes. It's open access on um, integrative and comparative biology. It's called Multivariate Models of Sex. Oh my gosh. How breaking binaries can improve our understanding of ecology and evolution. How do we get it all right? Integrative biology. Uh, integrative and comparative biology. Okay, what's the title again? Well, just if you search like multivariate models of sex, you can probably find it. Okay. Yeah. Bring it down. So, question two is on a previous slide, you had an aquatic carrot. Oh, yeah. Could you elaborate more on that? People don't know about that, that bird. Oh, wow. Let's see how much I know about the eclectus parrot. Do you know a lot about the eclectus parrot? I know you're not going to know if one has one. That's cool. So what I know is that um, they're actually a cavity nesting species, but they're primary cavity, so they excavate their own. And the females are more ornamented than the males. Just throw them on the slide. Cause they, cause sure, they're... we can go all the way back. Um, it might be easier if I do it from here because mm -hmm. it's quite early on. So that's one of the systems that we kind of more closely studied um, territoriality and the plumage signaling and found that it's stronger in those females. Yeah, and I believe it's, it is associated with territorial status. Well, it's a green bird with the red head. And, um, you have a female there, it was, it was a purple bird with a red head. Great, there we go, purple bird with here. Yeah, and a collectus here, so the females and males, and males kind of subvert your expectations. <laughs> yeah, um, so a lot of those examples, right, are subverting our expectations. And when we think about what those expectations are, I think a lot of them go all the way back to Darwin and um, you know, our perspective as like mammal people, right? So like a lot of times you see these mating systems and these strategies evolving in mammals and that's great. But if you expand your taxonomic diversity, you see that those aren't necessarily the norm. Um, and so I think, yeah, we are also influenced not only by the history of our field, but also our own like identity as mammals doing science. It doesn't look like the picture can load, so apologies for that. So the final thing I want to talk about and ask about is you mentioned a lot about how the hormones in the brain, the brain of the hormones and not quite vice versa. Do you have more on that? Like, oh, I would say um, so we think about a hormone like testosterone. Yeah. Um, it has kind of this um, many purposes function. So it's like a single hormone. Um, and actually there is no gene for testosterone. It's something that we like synthesize from cholesterol. So there are many genes that encode the enzymes that make testosterone. Um, but it definitely uh, can also be produced not only at the gonadal level, but also in the brain. So um, there's plenty of biosynthesis of testosterone happening in different brain regions. Um, and then hormones like testosterone, when they bind the androgen receptor, they, the androgen receptor is a transcription factor. So that, that is a directional influence. Um, but we can imagine how all the genes that encode the path, the biosynthetic pathway for testosterone are influencing testosterone levels. So definitely both directions are happening. Fascinating. So how does the environment affect that? Um, well, I guess in this particular case, um, there's this seasonal thing that happens with testosterone for lots of species of birds where um, we see it really increases in the breeding season. And uh, so the, the environment that's changing is um, 
all of a sudden now you're competing for mates and trying to attract mates. Um, but then we often see a dip in testosterone when it's the parental care season. So we kind of, um, this is, it's like a, in the non-breeding season, it's low and then it gets high and then it gets low again. Um, but it's interesting to think about when testosterone might be peaking seasonally for different species based on what they're doing. Yeah, maybe if we have, can take a different question. Yeah, happy to I'll, I'll yeah through the <laughs> lunch. Thanks for an awesome talk. Um, I was wondering in the earlier graphs where you had uh, female and then male courtship and male nesting. Yeah. Did you also look at female courtship? Yeah, so um, in Jacanas, like female territoriality and courtship are the same thing. And it, it's interesting, right? Like if we think about, so historically Jacanas have been considered sexual reverse. So you're like, okay, well the flip side must be like that they're like, courting and displaying for males, they don't really do that. Like when they're ready to breed, they like squat and then the male gets on top and then they copulate. Like there's not this elaborate courtship dance that we see in like the birds of paradise performed by males, right? So for them, like the courtship period is really like if you can get your territory and fight with the females for like the boundaries of that territory and just encompass the males, we have no evidence that males are mating outside of that pair bond. So if a male is on a female's territory, she's only she's only mating, he's only mating with her, but she's mating with multiple males. And so like mate choice in this system, like I have no idea how to go about setting that because it's really competition that seems to be driving like mating decisions. You could ask about like, are females sort of preferentially copulating with one male over another? There's a paper on a different species of Jacana called Yelling for Sex. Males that yelled more received more copulations and sired more of the eggs, um, the paternity of the eggs. But it's interesting to think about, you know, competition and parental care are not actually always the flip side of each other. And like, you know, mate choice and competition similarly are not always like one, it, the roles are not always like gonna just flip. So the, even like that, the, the term sexual reversal, I try to move away from it because it's like different for every system that we've named. Yeah, the animals are all doing their own thing. <laughs> That's fascinating. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for a really great talk. Um, I was really intrigued by the uh, results you had where you were comparing sort of the cavity nesters with the non cavity nesters in terms of this aggression. And the thing that really stuck out to me working on sparrows is just how low those sparrows were. And so, one thing that I was wondering that you might be able to comment on is how does aspects of, of those species sort of map onto these results? So it seems like sociality, yes. whether they have linear versus non-linear uh, dominance hierarchies, and even things like territory <clears throat> size. So could any of those sorts of factors at least maybe explain some of the sparrows, but maybe also some of the broader patterns that you see? Yeah, um, I, I really would have expected the house sparrows to be more aggressive because I, we hear about how like they're bad for bluebirds and they're you know constantly like fighting over territories with other species. But I think their sociality, they're really able to tolerate, tolerate um, common specifics in very close quarters. You know, when we were sampling house sparrows, Basically, every nest box that we put up, they would like readily take. But if you would go to the CVS down the road, there'd be like 10 in the CVS sign, like super on top of each other. Um, and so, yes, I think it's really important to think about not only the nesting strategy, but the life history and the social dynamics. Um, I actually haven't considered the territory size or the dominance hierarchy. So that would be really interesting to evaluate. We've definitely thought about the, the sociality thing, like barn swallows or colonial nesters. And they like seemed scared. Like, they were just like, ah, like standing there or like flying away. Um, yeah, and then the Eurasian tree sparrows weren't particularly aggressive. And then the, both the wrens were similarly aggressive. So in an ideal world, we would find species that had like identical life history traits and we would just control for nesting strategy, but we were limited. So, I mean, but that variation, I think can offer an opportunity to ask about those other traits. Yeah. I don't know if it's related, but for the aggressive behavior could be related to the K strategy and R strategy as well, the number of eggs. And I, I don't know if it's related to the phylogeny as well. That's cool. Yeah. Um clutch size is known for these species. Um and we haven't we haven't looked at that. So that's really interesting. There is something cool with eggs. So again, we did this all before the egg laying stage, but um 
in house runs, the females are really aggressive and they do this oviside thing. And so we were not actually sampling them at the time that oviside is happening. Like that's a little bit later in the season, um, but there are other researchers who have studied um, house runs. I, I said, I don't know if I said house runs, I mean house runs. Um, and the, yeah, so the, those females are um, attacking their own species, but also other species eggs to take over their territories. And we did find, um, you know, every season that we're cleaning out the nest boxes, we'll find like a takeover. It's like, you know, the bluebird comes in and then the house bird takes over, then the house wren. So there's this cool like um, heterospecific competition that I think is really interesting, but but not central to our question. So yeah, clutch size, um, territory size, I think we could do some more analysis there. That's really interesting. Any other questions? All right, uh, I guess with that, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Wonderful class. Thank you.